This is what you would see if it wasn't for the hardworking volunteers at Channel 10. But thanks to their great effort, this is what you get. I'm Bruce Lacroix, President of the Kootenai Home Business Association. This broadcast is an example of the many workshops which the association offers to its members. Right now we have Chris Witt. Chris is one of our members and a management accountant specializing in small business. The, uh, this broadcast is going to be talking about taxation and the home-based business and I now give you Chris Witt. Good evening. I'm very glad that you're all here. I hope it's actually evening when you're seeing the broadcast. I understand it'll be run several times and hopefully will reach a lot of people who are running home-based businesses. There's a lot of benefits to being a self-employed person. Some of the benefits are enjoyed by both people who are operating out of a storefront and by people who are operating within their own homes. People who are operating inside their own homes, though, have some pretty special kinds of deductions that they enjoy that other people don't. First of all, though, I'd like to talk about the importance of some of the things which are shared by home businesses. One of the most important things is the necessity for keeping good records. As a self-employed person, you have to be able to demonstrate and explain what your expenses are. You need receipts. You need some kind of a record keeping system, bookkeeping or uh, use of your bank. These kinds of things make quite a difference. I generally suggest to people that if you're in business and you're serious about being in business, you should have a bank account just for business activity. You should deposit all of your income into that bank account. And you should actually use the deposit slips that the banks give you. That sounds like a funny thing to say, but people will often just take their money in and, and deposit it without any kind of a receipt, without any kind of explanation of what it is that they're, they're uh, putting into the bank. So sometimes your business, especially if you're a small business and you're just starting, your business might not have quite enough cash flow to run itself. So you get some money from Aunt Jessie and, and uh, you put that in the bank. Well, if you don't say this is a loan from Aunt Jessie, your accountant or the tax man is liable to think that this is business income and you're going to have to pay tax on it and I'm sure that's not what Aunt Jessie intended. <laughs> so get a business bank account, actually use the bank account and actually use the deposit slips that the bank is going to provide you. They're free. Use them. Chris, you, were, um, you mentioned about uh, keeping receipts. What if I don't keep some receipts for some things? Uh, what, what can I do if I don't have receipts for every specific thing? It's really important to have receipts. If you lose receipts, your canceled check will sometimes be accepted by the government, but they don't have to accept a canceled check. For instance, if I'm your accountant and I send you a bill, you pay my bill and then you lose it. Uh, your cancelled check paying Chris Witt accounting might be accepted by Revenue Canada. On the other hand, they might say, well, Bruce, we think that you're friends with Chris and the two of you were, were gambling on something and you were paying a gambling debt. You have no way to prove otherwise <laughs> except to come and get the receipts from me. I'll keep receipts. Keep receipts. The other thing with receipts that some people forget about is that it's important that the receipt not only show the amount of money, but it also has to show what it was for. 
So if you've gone to a general department store and you've bought something, say some pencils at Woolco or Woolworths or the Bay or wherever, and these pencils are maybe only $1.98, the receipt from the store might not say pencils. It might say product number 2394864. Nobody knows what that is. <laughs> now, for a dollar ninety-eight, chances are Revenue Canada is not going to give you a problem with it. But it would be preferable to just write on the back of the receipt, pencils. If the receipt is over thirty dollars, you really should get a proper receipt that says what you bought. So, if you bought a desk, maybe a, a small bookcase, it was eighty dollars for a little bookcase. Make sure that your receipt says bookcase. Okay. Thank you. Some of the other things with your receipts that you should keep track of is that the receipt has to show the store's name. Some of them just say, thank you for your business. It would be really preferable if it had a store's name. Otherwise, you never know, maybe your neighbor has an old till that they're no longer using. They have uh, taken the store name off of the computer printout in the cash register, and they can print you cash register receipts at will. Do people do that? I'm sure they do. <laughs> and I'm sure that Revenue Canada is aware that people do that sort of thing. Personally, I've never seen it. But if I wanted to um, fictitionalize receipts, that's something oh. I, would, I would think people might do. Of course, it's totally illegal. And if I were to find out a client was doing something like that, I would no longer deal with them. Don't play those kind of games. It's not worth it. Have real receipts with real store names on it so you're not only honest, but you can prove that you're being honest. So, um, some special things about being a home-based business. There's a thing called a variable cost and a thing called a fixed cost. A variable cost is a thing where the cost will go up as the sales go up. Hopefully it's the other way around. Here's the sales and here's the costs. For instance, if you're a, a retailer, your sales are directly tied to your costs. So when you buy from the manufacturer for a dollar, you then sell the product for two dollars. That's a variable cost. All businesses have variable costs. The other kind of cost is a fixed cost. All businesses have fixed costs as well. They're things that don't increase. Your rent stays basically the same. We'll ignore inflation for the moment. Your rent stays basically the same. It's not tied in any way, shape, or form to your sales. Now, the real joy of the tax deduction system for a home-based business is that a number of costs which are fixed, personal expenses to anybody else, become a business expense for you. For instance, rent. If you're a storefront operation, your rent what might be five hundred or a thousand dollars a month and you get to deduct that in the meantime you also have a rent at home might be a mortgage payment or it might be a rent that you're making but that cost is not deductible the one on your home because you're deducting the storefront operation as a home-based business you can deduct the rent on your home or the mortgage interest that you're paying on your home the whole thing, the whole rent? Not all of it. We have to look at a square footage. And I'm going to come back to explaining more of the details. You're allowed to deduct what we call the business portion. So a bunch of fixed costs, which you would have to absorb as a personal expense, are now deductible as a legitimate business expense. So I'll just turn my notes over here for a minute to make sure I don't miss any important details. Some of the things that you can deduct are mortgage interest, rent, property taxes. Um, sometimes you can deduct landscaping. Parking for your clients or customers is certainly deductible. Uh, what are some of the other things that I'm missing? Heat and light? Now, you mean just a, a percentage of them, though, don't you? Not That's right. That's right. But to start with, what you should be doing is you should be collecting all of your expenses together. So you would collect together all of the costs of running the house. And we look at costs that would exist whether people live there or not. So my, uh, my insurance cost? The insurance on your home is deductible. Upkeep for my, my property or 
things like that. Landscaping, uh, lawns maintenance, shoveling the snow, snow in the removal. Winter time. These things are sometimes deductible to a home business, but okay. not always. It depends on the nature of your home business. If you're a writer and basically you are at home and you write and you send your manuscripts to the publisher, the publisher says yes, hopefully, and sends you money back. That's even better. Then you're not going to be allowed lawn mowing or flowers. But if you're a business uh, like mine where I have customers or clients coming to my home all the time, it's important that I have an attractive environment. Okay. So a few flowers out front are deductible, maybe a shrub. Certainly maintenance of a parking area for my customers is deductible and snow removal. I have a gravel road where I am, so grading the road and keeping it passable. Would that also include my taxes? Property taxes, yes, and that's a really nice feature is property taxes are deductible based on the gross property tax. Okay. So the homeowner's grant does not come into play on the calculation of business use of the home. The homeowner's grant is for your personal use of the home. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. I won't try to sneak that one by you then. <laughs> now in calculating how much of the, these expenses, once you've totaled them all up, you then have to calculate how much is a reasonable amount to deduct for your business. And that's usually based on your square footage. So if you're using a room which is 10 by 10 as your office area, and your home is 1,000 square feet, then that's 10% of your home. So 10% of your costs become okay. deductible. Can I estimate and say that about 15% of my home is used for business? Or do I have to have a, a fairly accurate... Uh, I always recommend accuracy. Accuracy, okay. I always do. If somebody has already moved out of a home and they failed to measure their actual square footage, then we really have no choice but to try to estimate something. Okay. And sometimes we can do that based on room size. That you were using maybe one room out of six rooms. They were all about the same size, so that would give you one sixth. Okay. And just just to clarify, this is just for inside my home. It doesn't include my property. I can't take a percentage of my whole. Um... Under some circumstances, you can. Uh, this is where you should probably see an accountant for the calculation of the exact cost. Okay. But information to take to the accountant might be. Um, if you operated, say, a bed and a breakfast operation, you have people using your home for um, to sleep over the night, to have their breakfast in the morning, and maybe you also have a gazebo and a fish pond and gardens in the back, and they're able to go and enjoy these areas in the evening and in the morning. They maybe could have their breakfast on the patio. The, some of that area would probably be deductible to a greater percentage than... So you'd be, then my fish pond. So you'd be, you'd be fairly clear then that if people are coming to your home as a home-based business, certain things will be allowed that if people are not coming to your home, you can't deduct. That's very true. Okay. You have to, in, in looking at any business expense, any business expense, you have to be able to show that that expense either allows you to make your income, uh, increases the likelihood of making more income, helps to protect your income in some way. My fish pond out back, does absolutely nothing for my clientele. Nobody sits out there waiting to see me. It's a little cold this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> the fish pond's purely a personal enjoyment <laughs> item. But the front flower bed, as people come into the building, mm -hmm. they do enjoy the flowers, and, and it's part of my image, and, and so those kinds of flowers are partially deductible. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is a, a number of there are some rules that people have to follow in having a home-based business. There were new rules that were determined in 1985, and Michael Wilson was the person in charge of these sort of decisions at the time. I'm sure he had good reason for what he did. He basically said that you now have to follow certain rules. One of the rules is the place has to be used totally for business. It has to be your uh, primary location. So for me, this is very simple. My primary location is in my home. 
that's where almost all of my business activity takes place. So that makes a lot of my home deductible. If you fall into that designation that your home is your principal place of business, the rooms you're using for business do not need to be exclusive business use. So I have a storage room which is partially business and partially family, roughly half and half, and so I call half of that a business use of the home. The next, um, I, I'll, maybe I'll give you a couple of examples of other sort of people who fall into that. The government's example in their brochure is of an anesthesiologist. The man actually does the job at various hospitals, but he does all of his paperwork in his home. He maintains his patient files in his home, his appointment calendars, his business records are in his home. So while he does no actual work in his home, it's still considered his principal place of business. But it would have to be a separate place in the home. It couldn't be off the kitchen table? It could be off the kitchen table. I, if this is your principal place of business, it could be, you know, shared space with the children's playroom if you were really that, you know, intent on having a business place. Well, uh, since a lot of home-based businesses do operate that way, where, where there isn't a set office in a separate room, mm -hmm. how, how would you determine what is what part of, the, of your kitchen oh. table is being used for, for business and what part is being used for pleasure. <laughs> now that, that's a, a tricky one and I think I'd like to come back to that after I explain okay. part two of the, the rules. If the office in the home is not your principal place of business, you do have a, a second location. This might happen say with a hairdresser who maybe operates primarily from a shop downtown. But she also does some work in her home and she has a small salon set up um, off the kitchen perhaps. Because her principal place of business is downtown, she falls into the next set of rules then. She has to be meeting customers or clients regularly and continuously in her home. So if she only sees customers at Christmas when there's a real rush and she has to do a lot of night work or weekends to make people pretty for their parties, that's not going to be allowed. It has to be a regular and continuous meeting of, of clients or customers in the home. The other thing is that the room must now be used exclusively for business. So if it isn't your principal place, you have two regulations. Mm -hmm. First of all, to meet customers and clients and exclusive use of the area. So then the next thing is to come back to what you're saying about how to calculate if it's shared use for people who fall into the principal use category. The government has a really excellent brochure. It's called Daycares in the Home. And this doesn't apply just to daycares, the piece I'm going to show you. It applies to anybody who has both shared and personal use of the home. It's uh, on here they talk about two different calculations. The first one is calculating if you have an area which is used exclusively for business. For instance, if, you're, if you are operating a daycare in your home and you have a playroom, mm -hmm. that room is 100% business. If that's 10% of your home, 10% of the costs are deductible. A daycare would often, however, also use the living room, the kitchen, of course, the, the bathroom. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Very important to a daycare. The daycare, yes. <laughs> and of course, the bedrooms are often used because the children usually will have a nap at once or twice a day. Hmm. So what we have then are a number of areas of the home which are used for eight or nine hours a day for the daycare and the remainder of the time for personal. Oh, okay. So our formula, instead of just working strictly on a square footage, percentage basis, we now have to look at comparing time and space. So if a hairdresser is actually having people come to her home, mm -hmm. that, that same formula would apply then? If she's, using, if she's using her home as her principal place. For, for five or six hours a day. For five or six hours, maybe she's using the kitchen area, mm -hmm. and that's shared business oh, okay. and personal, then she could use that kitchen area, say, eight hours a day, mm -hmm. eight out of 24. Oh, okay. Okay, that's so fairly... she would take the square footage that's being used and put in the time calculation. 
And I really recommend this daycare brochure for that calculation. They explain it very, very clearly how to make the calculation. And that applies to other businesses? Applies to all businesses, but this particular brochure is the best one okay. for explaining that particular split. Is there a charge for that? No, there's no charge for Good. any of the government brochures. Okay. And if you need to order 10 of them because you want to share them with your friends, you can do that too. Some of the other things I should probably mention while we're talking about an office in the home are some things that people think are deductible and are not. A typical example is your telephone. A small home-based business might not have a separate business phone line. If it's a personal phone line, then you are not allowed to deduct the basic rent. That's considered to be a personal cost. So the basic rent and the basic costs of having the phone are not deductible. That's my line in and my GST on my line in. And, and the rental of your, your the, equipment. Okay. Or the purchase of the phone? The purchase of the phone also, if it's, sh if it's both business and personal. Okay. It's considered every household needs a phone. That, of course, totally disregards the fact that there are a percentage of homes in Canada which do not have telephones. It has still been determined that a home requires a telephone and therefore that's a personal expense. Like a bathroom? Like a bathroom. Okay. So there are a number of homes apparently that don't have those either. <laughs> but that doesn't come into the tax act. Okay. The telephone part does. So with the telephone, uh, if you're making long distance calls which are business related, those are deductible. And don't forget to add the tax. Currently it's 13% in BC. 6% provincial tax, 7% mm -hmm. GST. So all my, all my tax on my long distance calls is also a business expense? Yes, it is. Just on the long distance calls? Just on long distance. Okay. Now, if you have more than one phone extension, maybe you have an office, mm -hmm. a separate office in your home, you're using the same phone line, the telephone equipment that's in the office area is deductible. So if you purchase a phone, purchase the one that goes in your office first. Right. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Continue to rent one from, from mm -hmm. the telephone company. Uh, the one that you purchase for your office will be a deductible business expense. Even if they're still on the same line? Still on the same line. But this one is used exclusively for business? That's correct. Okay. And the extension, the extra, what is it, a dollar or something a month for the extension into the office, the second line. Okay. That is deductible. Okay. Now, if you do have two phone numbers, one which is a business number and one which is a personal number, all of the business costs, the business phone line are still, right. they're fully deductible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. One of my favorites with long distance calls is people saying, well, I phoned my mother. Is that a business deduction? She's a very supportive person. <laughs> <laughs> is your mother a business person? If so, perhaps we may be able to deduct some of it. <laughs> Being supportive does not necessarily qualify. But if she loaned me the money and we're talking about the business, then we, we could put that in then, could we? Well, I think you better be very careful. One of the things the government looks for, and I, I think this is fair, they look for it to be a reasonable expense of doing business. If this person was not your mother but was a, an independent third party who had loaned you money, mm -hmm. what are the chances you would phone them on Christmas and discuss the situation for an hour? Well, probably not that great. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So be reasonable when you're talking about what kind of expenses you want to deduct. You've mentioned that a few times, actually, about being reasonable. Um, I imagine a lot of the uh, areas for home-based business are rather gray, depending upon each situation. They are. So are you then saying that if it is a gray area and you can uh, justify that it is reasonable that you would have this for your business, then chances are that it is a deduction? That's right. Okay. That's right. Some of the things that come along in terms of what is reasonable, what is not. My favorite example is the guy who has a little tiny business. His gross last year was $10,000. He went out and bought a $2,000 briefcase. This is not a reasonable expense. <laughs> <laughs> His $10,000 business does not require a $2,000 briefcase. Would Revenue Canada question that? I would expect so. I would expect so. Yeah, this is a textbook example. I've, I've never seen it actually in a tax case. Okay. He should learn how to run a business if he's doing that. $2,000 for a $10,000. Well, okay. one of, one of the, my favorite things to point out to people, or I think it's very important to point out, is that if you're making a business decision, it should be a good business decision. 
If it's not a good business decision, just because it's a good tax write-off, it's not a good plan. <laughs> would Revenue Canada question that and, and question your business decisions, or would they just go on what's reasonable? If you make a series of bad business decisions, um, they'll look on that on a case-by-case -case basis okay. to determine is there a, a scam happening here. And reasonable is one of their favorite words. They can determine a lot of the gray areas, make a decision based mm -hmm. on what they would consider reasonable. Which of course leaves you a lot of room to argue, but it takes time and energy to argue. And I think Make your decisions what it is you think you can write off by thinking them through carefully. And I always recommend speaking with a professional. Um, if you don't want to see a professional every year, well, go and see somebody every two or three mm -hmm. just to make sure you're up on the tax laws because they do change all the time. They're constantly changing. Okay. Yeah. Something else I should mention is they do talk about uh, deduction in the, when they talk about using your home, they say you can depreciate your home or use a capital cost allowance to write off part of the cost of the building. I was going to ask you about that one. Yeah, I consider that a really bad idea because right now as long as you don't depreciate your home, it's going to stay your principal residence. And when you sell it, any gain that you make is going to be tax-free. But if, if I'm writing it off on a regular basis, I'm not going to get that? That's correct. You're going to lose that capital so gains freebie. A short-term gain here for a long-term penalty down the road? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, so I really don't recommend depreciating it. I do have a couple of small businesses that I do work for where we are depreciating buildings. But they're not really buildings. They're more like a metal storage shed. They bought the ever favorite Sears, you know, metal backyard storage shed, two hundred dollars or something like mm -hmm. that, and they store some of their equipment in there. Well, that shed only has it has a restricted life. And if they were to sell it, they wouldn't have appreciated in value. That's right, and it's not a permanent structure; it's a mm -hmm. mobile structure. So we look at that when we're thinking about um, should we depreciate a thing or not. Okay. That's one of the questions I get quite often is, is about should I depreciate, can I depreciate this kind of a thing? Um, house improvements. If you rip off your roof and put a new roof on, that's a personal expense. That is a, uh, an improvement to your home. Can I take part of that 10%? If I'm using 10% of my home as a business space and it costs me $10,000 for a new roof, that's an expensive roof. Uh, could I take $1,000 of that expense and say, well, that is related to my business? Possibly, and then depreciate it. But okay. you'd have to go the route of depreciation, and then again, you're putting your house on the capital gains chopping block. Oh, then I'd have to look at the whole house again. Ah, uh -huh, okay. you would. But if, there's a, if your roof is leaking and then you patch it or you replace a couple of shingles, it's, then we're not looking at a major improvement. Now, how we make these kinds of decisions as accountants and hopefully the, the tax act is is reflecting how what we think is reality if it's of lasting benefit mm -hmm. if your home is going to enjoy the benefit for many years if it's going to improve the value of the home for many years like putting new siding a vinyl siding on your home that's going to have a life of i don't know 10 years 20. but painting your house if you're lucky is going to be good for maybe three so painting your house would be a repair and part of that would be considered a business expense, mm -hmm. providing you can show it's important that your house look attractive. Okay. Your publisher in New York probably doesn't care. No, they but don't. But as a consultant <laughs> with clients coming to your home, then mm -hmm. your clients do care that your home look attractive. So the paint job would be deductible. When we talk about the, the contents of the house, can you depreciate those? Mm -hmm. uh, I had someone in the office the other day. She's running a daycare. She had to buy a new kitchen table. Rough daycare. <laughs> <laughs> and she bought some new living room furniture as well. And she wanted to know, can she write these things off or depreciate them as business? Mm -hmm. And yes, she can. Because, because they were essential for her business? Well, when you're running a daycare, it's a little tricky without a kitchen table. Mm -hmm. You know, parents really want that kitchen floor clean otherwise. Now, let's say that kitchen table got broken by the children and she had to buy another one. Is that a cost of doing business? 
in order to have the kitchen table again? Ooh, that's a rough one. A rough one okay. <laughs> that's a rough one. I would say that it probably wouldn't be. What we would have is a situation where when she started the daycare, we would have estimated the value of the furnishings mm -hmm. and we would have been depreciating those. So the value of the table might have been written down from, uh, I don't know, $200 down to maybe 75 at the mm -hmm. time it was broken. A new table is then bought. That $75 that's remaining is added to the value of the new table and we continue to depreciate it. Okay. So a replacement of a table we probably couldn't do. But if she had a small record player or a um, some particularly items under two hundred dollars that two hundred dollars is a magic number in, in mm -hmm. the tax act under two hundred dollars we generally will write it off right away the year you buy it generally over two hundred dollars we're going to depreciate it over a number of years that's a question that comes up very frequently in my in my workshops on, on running small businesses mm -hmm. at what stage do I have to depreciate it over a period of years and at what stage can I just say okay this is all of one expense for one year right. so you're saying that's two hundred dollars two hundred dollars including taxes oh including taxes including taxes yeah so you're actually looking at a I don't know hundred eighty eight dollars hmm. something in that ballpark is okay. that right no, I'm waiting. You're the well. accountant. <laughs> I don't do numbers in my head. That's for calculators, oh, computers. Okay. <laughs> so it's about two hundred dollars is the maximum. That right. I can if that's save. the amount you're writing the check for is two hundred dollars, then we can look at writing it off. If it's under two hundred, rather. Mm -hmm. So if I buy a desk and an ensemble for two hundred fifty dollars, I have to look at doing that over some time. You're going to have to write that off over a period of oh, eight to ten years. It'll take to write that okay. off. Yeah. Okay. Um, in a daycare toys, we can write off immediately. Um, because they cost under $200. A swing set's going to be over, that's going to take a period of time. And the household furnishings work the same way. And we use the same calculation of cost times the number of hours the daycare operates divided mm -hmm. by 24, and that's how we then work the depreciation. But if it's a $1,000 couch and by the time we apply all the hours it comes out to 150 bucks, we still have to depreciate it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're looking at the total value mm -hmm. of the item before the... Revenue Canada filled that little loophole, <laughs> did they? <laughs> yes, okay. yes, indeed. Uh, something else that I'm often asked about is the life insurance on your mortgage, should you deduct that? Mm -hmm. I generally suggest that you don't. It's not a large item, and I think that it's... it's more of a personal kind of an expense, and chances are that that life insurance when it gets paid out or, you know, should you have been unfortunate to, enough to have died last week, that life insurance would then be paid out and there's a possibility it would then be considered as income okay. for the premium. And that's, again, a short-term gain on a long-term pain. Right. Yeah. We don't want those. We don't want those. We certainly don't want those. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. Uh -huh. There's another group of people um, I didn't mention who can also qualify for business use of the home. An employee can often qualify for business use of the home. Someone working for someone else, you mean? Someone working for someone else. And where this comes into play in, in the business people that I see is, uh, let's say a lady has a retail operation downtown. Her store is so full of products for sale, she doesn't have room for an office. Mm -hmm. So all of her business records are kept at home. Her principal resident or principal business site is still downtown. But if her business is a corporation, conditions of employment with the corporation could be that she has to maintain an office in her home. Okay. So a lot of people who are employees could be looking at the home-based business deductions that you're mentioning? Uh, yes, they could. Okay. Probably they a could. lot of them aren't aware of that. Probably not. It, it's, uh, the legislation is very specific. It's described in this tax guide on employment expenses. Uh, this is another government guide. Mm -hmm. And in this guide, they talk about the kinds of things you can and cannot deduct for your home, your office in the home, mm -hmm. and the conditions that you have to abide by. Okay. One of the uh, things that gets a little bit trickier on the employment situation is if, you're, if you are not a salesperson, you are a shop manager, 
a general manager of, of a business. Your office in the home is then more like the two business locations I mm -hmm. was talking about. Right. You have to have the workspace be the area where you do the majority of your work. Mm -hmm. So if your general job description is manager and managing the business is what you do, you have to be doing the majority of that in your home. If you're spending eight hours a day as a retail clerk and spending one hour of your day in your home doing the management, chances are your deduction will not be allowed. So if I'm, um, if I'm employed by someone else and I decide that uh, this sounds like a really good deal to write off part of my, my household expenses on, on my income tax return, I then decide, well, I'm going to set up an office and bring work home at the end of the day. That, they're going to frown upon that? It says the workspace must be the area where you mainly do your work. So someone bringing home on the work home on the weekend just to to finish it off or to that's not they're not going to not going to qualify. Well, mainly we try. means <laughs> principally, mostly, greater right. than fifty percent. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. Standard English yeah. definitions. Because I, I I think that people were trying to do that in the past where they were trying to deduct a home office just by saying, well, I'll do that to that's to right. bring down my taxes, and that's. They're fairly strict on that. They're fairly strict on that. One of the things that happened is the government decided somewhere along the line, probably in 1985, when Honorable Mr. Michael Wilson decided that there were a lot of people who were gouging, um, uh -huh. writing off an office in the home when they were actually only doing work in their home one hour out of a week. And it wasn't what was called reasonable for them to make that deduction. So they passed some very specific laws. Mm -hmm. If you want to know whether or not you qualify under the particular laws, you should read the guide. You should talk to Revenue Canada. You may also want to talk with an independent professional. The other qualification you have to have as um, an employee, not only do you have to have that where you mainly work, mm -hmm. also the room has to be used exclusively for business. And you also have to regularly and continuously meet with clients. This is the new oh, piece. Oh, there, there's where that catches that. that there's the there. new okay. piece. So the retailer I was talking about a minute ago, mm -hmm. she's not going to qualify unless she's regularly meeting people in her home. So if potential customers, mm -hmm. suppliers, if that's where she actually does her work and she's regularly meeting with important people in that space, then chances are she's got a deduction. But if she isn't regularly meeting with clients, customers, suppliers in that space, she does not. So she has to do all of the above. It has to, one, be the place where it, mainly her place of business, mm -hmm. okay? I, I've explained this badly. Let me back up a pinch. It has to be the principal place where she does her work. Right. Or it has to be exclusive use and regularly and continuously meeting with clients and customers, All right? Mm -hmm. So if this store manager very seldom is in the store and is actually at home doing the management, then this person would be allowed. But if it's not where they almost always work, they would then have to have exclusive use and be meeting clients or customers there. Right. That made right. sense. Okay, if they want to do that as an employee, they also need to file a form called a T-2200, and I think I have one here. Yes, I do, a T-2200, and it's called Conditions of Employment. That has to be signed by their employer. Where can I get all these forms? From the government, Revenue the government. Canada's number. It's a 1-800 number, and it's in the um, blue pages of your phone book. They'll send me all this stuff out. They'll send you all of that stuff out. Okay. They're actually pretty quick about mailing things. I oh, I'm sure they I are if we owe them money, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, mostly I find I can phone them and say, I need this brochure or this form, and I'll have it within the next day quite often. And sometimes it takes two or three. But mostly it's next day. They're pretty efficient mailing me brochures. <laughs> okay. Another thing to be noted on these employees, people in an employment situation who want to write off part of their home, are employees who are commissioned salespeople. Mm -hmm. They have um, better deductions than the other employees. The other employees, uh, for instance, this business manager, hypothetical business manager, 
that person is allowed to write off rent if they're paying rent. They have a percentage of their rent, but they're not allowed a percentage of mortgage interest or property taxes or insurance on the home. So the largest expenses for the home are disallowed for the regular employee. Okay. Those expenses are all allowed if you're self-employed and your home is your principal place of business. Oh, okay. But not for an employee. But a commissioned sales employee is allowed to deduct everything except the mortgage interest. I won't ask why. I don't know. Okay. That's why I wasn't going to ask. <laughs> I have no idea what the reasoning is there. I do know that it's the single largest expense for most home-based businesses. It, just to clarify, Chris, when you say that if, uh, if someone is self-employed in their home, the, the percentage of their total rent, let's say, again, using 10% of the home mm -hmm. as an office, 10% of the rent is deductible. That's correct. But on mortgage, it's only the, the principal, or it's only the interest on the mortgage. It's not the principal itself. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. As a percentage of, of the As house. As a percentage. That's true of all loans that are related to a business, whether it's a car loan, an equipment purchase loan, an operating loan. Mm -hmm. All loans have two components. One which is paying back the principal portion. What you borrowed. The amount that you borrowed, and the other which is paying the interest. What they make. <laughs> what the banks make. Somebody told me that they were trying to explain this to their child, and, and the child came up with the most ingenious answer. Or, or way of looking at it. The child said, well, if I borrow money from the bank and they charge me extra, that's like charging me rent on the money. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, what a delightful that's way to explain it. <laughs> that's a good analogy. Yes, I thought so. The child was only nine. And I thought, wow, that's great. That's great. I'll have to use that sometime. <laughs> this child is going to be an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> this child just might be an accountant, yes. It wasn't even my kid. <laughs> so some of the other things we should talk about that Commonly missed expenses for people who are operating out of their homes. Cleaning. Cleaning. Cleaning the office area, most definitely. Oh. Now, you're not allowed to deduct your own time for the cleaning, but if you hire someone It'll else... It'll take me a year and a half, probably. <laughs> <laughs> if you hire someone else to do the cleaning, mm -hmm. that is allowable, and you can certainly hire your spouse if you wish, mm -hmm. if that's beneficial. You're also allowed to hire your children. And pay them a fair... Well, pay them what you would pay anyone else. My rule if I'm hiring a child is I look at the job and I say, if I were to hire a reasonably competent adult to do the job, what do I think they would charge me? And it's legal to hire children to work in your home? Sure, sure, yeah. Okay. yeah. You have to be careful the number of hours if it's not your own kids. Mm -hmm. And you would probably have to get special permission and so right. on. But if it's your own children, you're not going to have a problem with, you know, hey, one hour. <laughs> clean mm -hmm. the office. Oh, great. And that cost of hiring them is deductible. It certainly is. It certainly is. However, you have to report that as part of their income when you fill out your tax return claiming them as dependents. Oh, take out of this pocket, put back into that one. Well, children <laughs> are allowed to earn about 2000 oh, 2700 I think, this year before it affects your oh, tax right? deduction. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. Three-year-olds are not very good at cleaning, by the way, so don't try Mine's to really good at messing. <laughs> Again, we come back to the idea of reasonable, <laughs> reasonable, right? reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, with the cleaning, the, we also get into some other things that um, cleaning more than just the office area. If your clients are coming into your home and they're walking through a shared area to come to your office. And if they have to go through the living room, you mean to get to the office? They have to come or? through the living room or, or some other kind of, you know, shared personal residence plus business area, mm -hmm. then the cleaning of that would also be partly deductible. Percentage again of... Yeah, reasonable. reasonable. Well, you're going to be hating that word by the end of this. <laughs> no, that's... A, <laughs> well, I think it's good to, uh, to reiterate it, reasonable over and over again because a lot of it is so... Very no gray. Black and white. Very a, gray. Yeah, it's a matter of, of trying to justify, come up with a good explanation of why you think what you've done is fair. Okay. Right. So those are a couple of the sometimes missed deductions. Missed deductions. Some other ones, um, coffee. If you have customers or clients coming to your home, it's reasonable that you would have coffee and provide them with a, a beverage such as coffee or tea. Um, the, the fixings that go with it, cream and sugar, those kinds of things, and also your coffee machine. Hmm. The proverbial writer at home who sits there cracking out novels is probably not going to be allowed his coffee pot and, and uh, four pots of coffee he drinks a day. Okay. But, if, but if someone's coming into the home, that's, that's right. reasonable. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
the, the coffee otherwise is considered a personal living expense. <laughs> personal living expenses are something that the government likes to talk about a lot when they're deciding if it's deductible or not. Mm -hmm. For instance, your business suit is an important part of your image as a consultant. People need to see you as a successful person with a, a nice suit, know how to dress well and so on. It's part of your image. The suit's not deductible. The, the government's opinion is you need clothes anyway. <laughs> Depending what type of a consultant you are, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we won't go into that one. <laughs> That's one home-based business we do not talk about tonight. Right, right. Um, so your clothing is, is not allowed as a deduction unless it's specialty clothing or it's destroyed in the course of your work. So, so if I was if, a carpenter and I needed um, Right, a, a carpenter an with, with an apron, a carpenter with hearing protection. Um, if you're a construction carpenter, you need um, head protection. You might also need sight protection in some jobs, uh, special work boots, work gloves. Those kinds of things are deductible because they're special uh, requirements for safety in your job. A dentist maybe who has a home office as, as part of, uh, or actually has their office in their home, uh, if they were meeting clients in their home and they had a small room for dentistry, their, their outfits and their assistant's outfits would if be... Providing their outfits are of the nature of a uniform or a smock or a lab coat. Right. Okay, regular okay. street clothes don't count. Mm -hmm. In some circumstances, though, your regular street clothes might be damaged or destroyed in the nature of your work. Mm -hmm. If um, someone was required to go down to um, a railway siding to inspect an incoming shipment and they rubbed up against something and either destroyed a jacket or it required cleaning, the cost of having that cleaned would be deductible. We would be able to make some kind of a claim if it was totally destroyed, but replacing it entirely would not be okay. fully deductible. So I can't go out and buy four Armani suits and claim that as a business expense as... Right, not okay. allowed, not allowed. Some professions, their clothing is not required, um, doesn't have to be a special safety kind of clothing, but it's destroyed in the course of their work. Hairdressers, for instance, mm -hmm. their clothing is damaged by the dyes and the bleaches and the, and the chemicals that they're using, and so they are allowed to deduct a little for the damage to their clothing. It makes good business sense to buy a good color cape, they call it. It's mm -hmm. a plastic right. protection thing or something to protect their clothing from the damage. And that would be deductible? Yes, indeed. The color cape is fully deductible, but if your clothing happens to incidentally be damaged, right. we could probably make some kind of a deduction for it. Your work shoes are not normally deductible unless they're a safety shoe of some sort. Right. Uh, are there any other small little deductions that sometimes sort of slip through? As Things that, that people regularly miss? That, that can certainly help bring the taxable income down. Well, one of my favorites is the guard dog. The guard dog? The guard dog. Oh, yeah, the guard dog. Ah. No cats. There, there's no, no cats. <laughs> I have an attack fish. That doesn't well, count? No, the okay. attack fish doesn't count, nor does my cat. I have this big one, nearly as uh -huh. big as a dog. No, he doesn't count either. <laughs> But a guard dog, in some situations, it's important to have a dog that will um, warn you if someone is coming onto your property, particularly if you've got things stored outside of your mm -hmm. home. If you're in the construction business, perhaps, or you have a, a repair shop, people might break into your buildings and right. steal your equipment um, or, or do damage. So a guard dog, under some circumstances, will be deductible. The feed, the vet costs. Mm. Um, possibly grooming. Let's not push it, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can try until we're audited. Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> Let's try and avoid an audit. Avoid yeah, it. Okay. they're not happy not, feelings. No. They're, it's not okay. a happy experience. No. What about a secure? If I put a security system along, along the perimeters of my windows and doors, and a certain percentage uh, of that would be deductible? No, you're getting into the home improvement versus the office improvement concept. To save all the customers' files I have on my computer. Okay, my office has a security system. It has burglar alarms in mm -hmm. it and fire alarms and and so on. The burglar alarms in my office protect my office. Mm -hmm. They do not in any way, shape, or form protect my home. So then, that's a complete. That's a complete business deduction. They're okay. also fairly easily removable from the building. I could take them out of the building without destroying the building. Now, these are key points. Are you, uh, is your entire home benefiting from the thing you have done? Mm -hmm. Is the thing removable? So if I knock a wall out or, or put a wall up in my office? 
your entire home is hopefully benefiting from the action. Right. But if I just stick some stuff on the wall, that's a different right. story. So if you have a bookcase and, and you knock out a piece of the wall, you knock out some of the, the gyp rock and mm -hmm. you do a lovely installed uh, mahogany bookcase and it's sunk into the wall. It's just gorgeous, beautiful thing. That is now part of your home. It is not deductible. Okay, so I don't care how gorgeous it is. It's not deductible. Okay. So if I can pick it up and carry it away, it's a business expense. Is that's that right. What, what that's you're right. It, even if it's attached to the wall, right. if you could remove it from the wall without destroying the nature of the building, the integrity of the house. Okay. Right. Okay. Then that that's going to be part of your office. Mm -hmm. And again, when we're looking at is it an asset which we depreciate over a number of years, or is it um, a piece of office? Uh, supply type thing that we can write off today. Right. We'd again be looking at the $200 limit plus possibly some other factors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So That's fairly clear. To, all right. What else do small or do home based business people sometimes forget to deduct? Well, one of the things that they ask me about a lot is their carpeting and carpeting. their draperies and wallpaper and paint and things like that. Well, I just actually re-wallpapered my office. Okay. Just the office, not, not the rest of the house. Okay. When I, if I ever decide to close down, I'm not going to peel the wallpaper off the wall and take it with me. Is that considered a deduction? Yes, it is, because it's not of um, a lasting benefit in terms of lasting for many, many years. Okay. It's also not a highly expensive thing, like replacing a roof. Right. And we'd look at the same thing with the draperies. Well, with the draperies, unless they're really custom built um, and very, very expensive, chances are they would be considered part of the office decor. What about converting the room? I'm sorry. Yeah. What about converting the room in the house to an office? Is the cost of converting the room to an office by putting up, you know, nice shelving and by putting, you know, painting the walls and, you know, putting some carpet in there because the mm -hmm. cut down on the noise and the dust, you know, for the computers okay. and that. Is that a deduction? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Thank I'll you for answering that. That's a definitive <laughs> answer there. Okay, you've, you've covered all the bases there, Chris. <laughs> oh, I didn't throw in maybe. Oh, yeah, that's true. I missed that one. Okay. <laughs> what we have to look at is the nature of what you've done. Mm -hmm. If you had a basement which had nothing in it, it was just a, a concrete basement. Right. Um, and you put in gyp rock and you put in subflooring and the whole nine yards. All of that work is going to be considered part of the principal residence. It's not going to be deductible. Even though it wasn't there before and I'm using it strictly for an office? That's correct, because it's now okay. part of the building. Okay. And the building is going to enjoy lasting benefit. And I'm not going to tear that down if I ever move. Well, why would you? Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You'd have to be just a little bit crazy. Re Revenue to tear Canada that doesn't out. take that into account? No, they don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> they operate on the premise that all taxpayers are sane. Um, okay. <laughs> I won't touch that one. Okay, good. <laughs> Some of the other things, though, if we look at the, the other idea is that the room already exists, mm -hmm. but it maybe has a linoleum floor, and so you want to put in a carpeting, as you say, to cut down on the noise. If you put in a very expensive broadloom with a 15 or 20 year life, you have probably added to the value of the home and should not be deducting it. If the broad loom is removable, we could then oh, depreciate it okay. over a period of time. So this is where the reasonable comes in again, and does it is of lasting quality. And that's right. Okay, that's so right. That's why I buy cheap carpet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is why I can see that the advantages of going to see someone uh, like yourself who's in a position to know all these things before you set up a home-based business, to know before you start, mm -hmm. you know what you can and can't do before you decide to renovate your home for ten thousand dollars, thinking you're going to. To be and able that to is a business it. expense, right? That's right. That's okay. right. So again, we come back to the concept of make a decision because it's a good business decision, mm -hmm. not because it's a good tax deduction. Right. But sometimes the two should mix. And so speaking to someone before you go out and spend all your money is... So if I idea. decide to go out and buy myself a new BMW next week because I think it really is going to help me get more business, that's not going to be a very good idea? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> that's another thing where the reasonable clause comes in. If you live in a, a very large and expensive mansion and you're I don't. using... No, you don't. I no. don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come visit next week, especially if you have a pool. I'm crazy about swimming pool. Anyway, if, if a person lives in this huge mansion and they're using one room as maybe a dog grooming parlor mm -hmm. for their friend's poodles, um, chances are they're not going to be allowed a very large expense 
even though that house is very expensive to maintain, mm -hmm. it's not going to be considered reasonable. In other words, they would be able to obtain the same kind of space somewhere else for a lot less money. Right. Mm -hmm. What about um, one of the things that I know I missed last year on my income tax return was I, I leave my home a lot to go downtown and I take my car and I, I put a bunch of stuff in it and I park and I plunk a quarter in here and I plunk a quarter in there and I plunk a quarter in someplace else. I should probably walk, but it's a little difficult with all this <laughs> stuff. I mean, those quarters that I'm plunking into the yeah. parking meter, to me that's a business expense because this I'm going sure to is. the credit union, I'm going to the post office. And yeah. Well, you know, the easiest way of handling those kinds of things and the car wash as well, buy a roll of quarters. Oh, I forgot that one last year. Car wash. You forgot, the, forgot car wash. the car wash. Okay, <laughs> buy a roll of quarters, put the rolls in your glove box, Keep the paper in the glove box. At the end of the year, you pull out the number of rolls, and there you have your tax deduction. Oh, you mean when they come rolled up in quarter? Uh huh. I so just, just, just save the up, pieces 10, of paper. 20, 30, 40 dollars. And that was all parking you. for business? For parking and car washes, yeah. What does Revenue Canada say about that? Revenue Canada says that's fine. If you can demonstrate again that it's reasonable. So if you're saying you wash your car every day, you're out of luck. Okay. All right. So we come back again and again to the idea of reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I brought one other brochure with me that I didn't show you yet, and it's the Business and Professional Income Tax Guide for 1991, and it has a couple of things in it specifically for home-based business. One of them is the description of the ki kinds of things a self-employed person can deduct. Oh, yes. Okay. And the other one is the actual calculations. So by getting these brochures, it'll help a person. Okay. I, I can okay. pick this up locally in town? No, you have to order these from Revenue, Revenue Canada. Canada. I have some in my office. Most accountants do, but don't count on it. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. You've uh, you've opened my eyes up as you always do every time we talk. I always find a few other new things that uh, that I didn't know about. And thank I hope you. that the uh, the viewers who have home-based businesses or are thinking of, of starting home-based businesses, I hope that Chris's uh, discussion today has uh, has helped you. Uh, we have a few other sources, actually, for people who are uh, in a home-based business who are looking at uh, some assistance with their uh, our taxation. Your local library, of course, is always a good source of information, as are uh, some books published by the self Council series. They have quite a few uh, updated versions of different books that will help home-based business people with tax and deductions and, and what is allowed, what isn't allowed. The CCH Guide to Tax Returns, is another good source. And then Revenue Canada, as Chris mentioned, does publish a fair number of, uh, of pamphlets. There's the uh, Revenue Canada Business Guide. There's the Revenue Canada, sorry, the Business and Professional Income Tax Guide, which is available from uh, Revenue Canada. The Daycare Guide, which as Chris mentioned, is very helpful for uh, determining what is a space in your home that's allowed and what isn't. There's the Employment Deduction Guides, a Rental Guide, and the T2200, or the IT180, or the IT514 guides, all available from Revenue Canada by looking in the blue pages of the phone book under federal government, and there'll be a 1-800 number. And as Chris says, they're very quick to send you books when you're owing them taxes. Another, of course, good source of information for home-based business people is the Kootenai Home Business Association. Uh, which meets on a regular basis. Uh, if you are interested in finding out more about our association, you're more than welcome to call me at 352-3878. Uh, I'd be very happy to tell you more about the association. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. It's been a pleasure. It has been.
Welcome to Physical Images. Today we're going to be doing some work on some of the flexor muscles in the abdominals. I want to focus on your breathing to start out with. We're going to do some light stretching. I want to start with the feet on the outside of the hips. I want to focus on pressing the feet into the floor, the heels and the toes. So they're going to pull the knees out over top of the toes. Pull the buttocks tight just lightly so you're supporting the hips and the lower back. I'm going to start out with a, a stretch through the arms and the, the hands. I'm going to start by pressing one palm, the left palm in front of you. I'm going to take the other side facing out and just reach around the thumb. I'm going to pull it into the body and inhale and then exhale and stretch out through the arm. Don't want to hear any popping here. <laughs> just relax and breathe and let the stretch happen. And take the index finger. Just wrap the fingers around so that the palms away. And inhale and exhale and stretch out through the arm, breathing deeply. And bringing it up. And inhale and exhale and stretch out through the arm. In Oriental medicine, each one of the fingers represents an organ in the body, and the meridians are connected to that. So what we're doing, actually, we'll take the next finger, is releasing some of the stress or tension in those meridians, opening them, allowing your energy to flow a bit more freely through the body. Use your breath. Inhale. And exhale. And just gently, just feel a light stretch in the body. On the other side, press the right palm out. Just slip the thumb into the, the crest there. Pull it in, pulling it in. Inhale <laughs> and exhale. <laughs> you can do shadow puppets this way too. <laughs> and inhale and take the index finger and exhale and stretch it out. Whichever way works for you. <laughs> And inhale, and exhale. And inhale, and exhale. And the last one, inhale, and exhale. And bringing the palms together in front, we're going to press the elbows up. Press the palms out just a little bit in front and breathe deeply. I'm going to feel a stretch through the chest and through the insides of the arms here. And extend the arms, press the palms together, reaching up overhead. Lift with the chin, don't let the head fall back. Breathe deeply. I'm going to stretch out those abdominals, keep the knees slightly bent so you're not locking anything back here. And exhale, press the palms towards the floor, sweeping down to the sides, and relax the head forward. I'm just gonna take it right to the floor here, but as you can, we're just gonna contract the abdominals and bend the knees and just slowly let the arms slide down through the body to where it's comfortable, and then to the floor if you can here. We're gonna keep it up on the, on the feet and <laughs> stretch out the legs. I'm gonna walk the fingers out in front. And lengthen the right leg and bend the left knee over top of the toes so that you're gonna get a stretch through the hip and the back of the leg. Breathe deeply. And relax the neck. And lengthening the bent leg and bending the other side. And breathe deeply. Really let the knees go over the knee go over top of the toes in front. 
So you're not twisting the hips here. And breathe deep into the body. And bringing it back to center, keeping the knees slightly bent, and reaching out front with those arms. We're just gonna press the left shoulder towards the floor and give a stretch through the back. And breathe deeply and keep the knees bent. And the other side, pressing the right shoulder towards the floor and relax the other to the left side. Breathe deep into the abdominals. And relax. I'm gonna take it right down to the floor here. I'm gonna keep the buttocks pulled tight, lightly. Bring the heels in close to the buttocks. I wanna focus on breathing deep into the abdominals here. The abdominal muscles run right from the base of the pelvis right up into the upper chest. So I want to focus on working with those muscles. You're going to inhale and lift, extend the abdominals. So you're reaching up. Then exhale and press the back to the floor. But we're not forcing anything here, remember. Contract the abdominals and press the back right to the floor. And inhale. and exhale. And inhale. Really release the muscles through the back and the abdominals as you exhale. And one last time. And pressing to the floor. I'm gonna take the right hand behind the head just place the left hand on the lower abdominal and we're going to pull the knee in and reach up towards the knee here. I'm going to keep the foot flexed and then as you exhale, let the heel come to the floor and push away and straighten on the floor so you're not putting any stress on the lower back. And inhale, tracing the foot up along the floor and lifting with the elbow. And make the movement synchronous with your breathing. Inhale and exhale. And inhale. And exhale. And inhale, last time. And exhale. I'm going to bring the knees back to center. And take the left hand behind the head. And the right hand onto the lower abdominal. As you're lifting, feel how the muscles are contracting in the abdominals. And as you inhale, again lift the elbow to the knee. Flex the foot so that you're supporting the back. As you exhale, press along the floor and out so you're supporting the back. Inhale and bringing it in. And exhale. And inhale. And exhale. And the last time. Inhale, and exhale, and bringing the knees back to center, and relax the back. We're going to do the abdominal again, inhaling and lifting, and exhale, and pressing the back flat to the floor, and inhale. And pressing to the floor. Inhale. 
and exhale. And again. And we're gonna bring the right hand again behind the head and the left hand onto the lower abdominal. And again, this time, we're gonna start with the opposite side. The left knee to the right elbow, lifting up. Inhale. And exhale, and tracing along the floor. So you're supporting the back. And inhale. And exhale. And inhale. The flexor muscles work in conjunction with the extensor muscles in the back. So you want to keep them relaxed at all times. Because when we're under a lot of stress, the abdominal muscles can contract, and the extensor muscles in the back can contract, and it can cut off our breathing. So we breathe really shallow. And extend it down. And bringing the knees back to center and to the other side. The hand, left hand behind the head, the right hand on the lower abdominal. And inhale, flexing the foot. And exhale and down. And the left elbow to the right knee. And exhale. When we don't breathe deeply, and we're cutting off that breath, making it shallow. We also change the rhythm of our heartbeat. So we want to really work on focusing on relaxing and breathing deeply. And the last time, inhale and exhale and bringing the knees back to center. I'm gonna take both hands behind the head. And just lifting here, inhale, and exhale, and relax down. And inhale, really pressing the lower back to the floor, and exhale, and bringing it down. And inhale, and exhale. Remember, don't stress or strain here, just to where it's comfortable. And this time, we're going to lift the knees and bring the elbows in at the same time. Inhale, flexing the feet. Exhale, and bringing the heels right down, right behind the buttocks. And inhale, and exhale. And inhale. Really contract the abdominals as you exhale, so you're pressing the back to the floor. And one more time. Inhale. And exhale. And we'll stretch out the abdominals one more time. Relax the arms at the sides. Inhale, lifting up. Exhaling, pressing the back to the floor. Inhale. And expand. Exhale. And contract. and pressing it down and relax. Hope we brought something here for you today that you can use every day. Have a great day and thank you for joining us. This is what you would see if it wasn't for the hardworking volunteers at Channel 10. But thanks to their great effort, this is what you get.
the fact that Nelson has the highest proportion of artists and craftspeople per capita in BC, and the community's support and desire for arts education add up to a strong argument that Nelson be the home of a provincially funded BC Interior Art School. All the knowledge gained from the previous closures can now be put to use to ensure that the new KSA is structured in such a way that it has a fair chance of survival. With the support of the community, that's all it really needs. like the very informal teaching and it's just it's as if you were coming home to somebody's house and learning from an aunt or, or someone like that. I, I think we're looking at the equivalent of 150 full-time jobs in the area of, of working artisans. Um, so that and what's disturbing to me about that is, <laughs> is that in looking around I don't see um, in the galleries that I'm dealing with and uh, talking to other other artisans, there are very very few people working who are under the age of 40. There seems to be a big gap, and so that primarily for me, that's that's uh, that's disturbing from a cultural society point of view. I think it should be disturbing uh, to the government all, also on an economic level. If if you have 150 people working, for instance, in a region like this, in the arts and are aren't any young people coming up. It's like not having the people, it's like a sawmill that's going under. Well, I see KSA as being um, not fully developed. It still has a lot of rough edges to it in terms of just the mechanics of getting that school together. We've had to move into locations for our drawing classes, which were totally inappropriate for that class, but it was the best they could do under the circumstances. Um, and I think that that's just symptoms of being a school getting off the ground. Uh, it certainly has the um, potential. It would be nice to design a building specifically for art. It's a it, it, lineage and mentor system are two uh, sort of compatible ways of teaching. Uh, for me, in my field, we don't have a very formalized training system. I often think it's because the investment in studio based teaching is a, is a heavy one for a, a school with a wider teaching base to absorb. And so one of the things that we've often had to do in textiles is to seek out people who know what we want to know and stick with them until we've got it all and then go on. And we pass that on to the students. In my case, I can trace my lineage back a couple of generations and, and I know from students' work that I've seen that it will go forward. I think KSA is a wonderful thing. It's the, the, the people around here are the greatest resource that, that are in the, that's in the Kootenays. You know, they, they don't wear out. They, you can't clear cut them. And, and uh, it's, I, I'm sure there's more people doing more interesting things here per, per population than anywhere. We want to make sure that that one or two things are non-negotiable. First of all, autonomy. No matter what happens as a result of the community um, the commission, uh, whatever possibility is, is the result of it, whether it's a, a, an independent art school, whether it's an art school which is connected with the Nelson University Center, whether it's a, an art school connected with Selkirk College, whether it's a, a, a brand new university, um, whatever, Whatever results will, we insist, will um, have an autonomous KSA.
Well, I was on faculty at David Thompson University Center here in the early 1980s, and uh, I was part of the faculty that taught writing. And then <clears throat> when David Thompson was shut down in 1984, I was part of the group in Vancouver that wanted to go on and keep alive the kind of innovative programming that we had developed here in Nelson. So we formed a thing called the Kootenai School of Writing in Vancouver, which really attempted to, to reproduce and go further as a post-secondary facility for writing. Mm -hmm. I moved back to the Kootenays in 1989, and this year when um, the Kootenay School of the Arts was formed, they asked me if I, if I would teach the writing course this fall, which I was very pleased to do so because uh, I really believe in Nelson as a site for uh, post-secondary education in the arts, just because I was privileged to have a taste of what we had here in the early 1980s, and so I know it works. I know this is the right place for it. So I was really happy to be part of, of the beginnings of KSA. After seven months of organizing and planning by volunteers, Kootenai School of the Arts offered three courses to the public in the fall of 1991. Tom Wayman's writing course, Judith McKenzie's introduction to textiles, and the drawing course instructed by Phyllis Margolin, Robert Inwood, and Elf Crossley were all fully subscribed, 50 students in total, with 27 more on the waiting list. In the winter 1992 semester, KSA offered eight more courses, and with registration still underway, more than 80 new students have enrolled. That's over 130 students in KSA's first year of operations. However, everyone involved realizes that there is only so much that can be accomplished by a volunteer-driven organization. To realize their goals, to offer quality instruction from respected artists in a proper facility, and to regain the international reputation of the original KSA, they require funding from the provincial government. KSA operated as a successful art education institution with an international reputation from 1960 to its amalgamation with DTEC in 1979. Unfortunately, that amalgamation, though seemingly logical at the time, proved to be KSA's death warrant when DTUC was closed by the provincial government five years later. By funding KSA, the provincial government would be bringing back the majority of DTUC's programs. While the terms university and DTUC are often seen as synonymous, in fact, 75% of DTUC programming was in the arts. Music, theater, writing, visual arts, graphics, photography, creative woodworking. Selkirk College still offers the woodworking course and they now have a new music course in Nelson. With reasonable funding and the community support, KSA can once again offer the other arts programs that DTUC's closures took away. That that drawing course would be a better drawing course than you could get at, at any of the established art schools right now. I think it would be very unusual to, to have access to four people with working full time in an area with 20 to 40 years experience. What we want to incorporate into our teaching style. It's very important for us to know that students have a good, strong, physical base in their knowledge that they learn with their hearts and their hands as well as their head. Uh, these are people of, of uh, national and international caliber. Um, they, they have a track record in terms not only of their art but of their ability to teach because it's not enough to be a, an artist if you can't convey the, uh, you know, pedagogically what it is to make art. Um, so these people are able to show, I mean, their, their credentials are their work, but they also have teaching experience. They learned in a way that I never did when I was a writing student, say, at UBC. Um, they learned that, that the issues or problems in one art form have their parallels in, in, in other art forms, representation versus non-representation, and a thousand other issues. So they grew as writers. And they, and they grew as people, too, mm -hmm. with, that, with that exposure. So that, to, to other artistic disciplines. So that's what I'd love to see happen at KSA. Mm -hmm. Programs in the arts, which in essence are all about communication, are needed more in our country today than ever. We will never be closed down again by outsiders. <laughs>